Shakespeare's Histories, The Queen's Storm, Episode 4. After 29 years of fighting between France and England, the Treaty of Tours has established a new period of peace. The terms stipulate a two-year truce and the marriage of King Henry VI of England to Margaret of Anjou, niece to the French king Charles VII. William de la Pole, the Marquis of Suffolk, presents Margaret to Henry and the English court, including Henry's uncle, Humphrey the Duke of Gloucester, who still serves as Lord Protector. Circling him are the other members of the peerage who have personal stakes in both French lands and the throne of England. The Cardinal Winchester, the Countesses Warwick, Somerset, and Buckingham, and Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York. As by your high imperial majesty, I had in charge at my depart for France to marry Princess Margaret for your grace— so, in the famous ancient city tours, I have performed my task and was espoused. And humbly now, upon my bended knee, deliver up my title in the queen, the happiest gift that ever Marquis gave, the fairest queen that ever king received. Suffolk arise. <laughs> Welcome, Queen Margaret. I can express no kinder sign of love than this kind kiss. O oh Lord, that lends me life, lend me a heart replete with thankfulness, for thou hast given me in this beauteous face a world of earthly blessings to my soul. Great King of England, and my gracious Lord, the mutual conference that my mind hath had, by day, by night, waking and in my dreams, in courtly company, or at my beads, with you, Mine alder leafest sovereign makes me the bolder to salute my king with ruder terms such as my wit affords and over joy of heart doth minister. Her sight did ravish, but her grace and speech makes me from wandering fall to weeping joys such as the fullness of my heart's content. Lords, with one cheerful voice, welcome my love. Long live Queen Margaret, England's happiness. We thank you all. My Lord Protector, so it please your grace, here are the Articles of Contracted Peace for 18 months concluded by consent. <sighs> Imprimus, it is agreed between the French King Charles and William Delapole, Marquess of Suffolk, Ambassador for Henry, King of England, that the said Henry shall espouse the Lady Margaret, daughter unto Rainier, King of Naples, Sicilia, and Jerusalem, and crown her Queen of England ere the 30th of May, next ensuing. Item, that the Duchy of Anjou and the County of Maine shall be released and delivered to the King, her father? Uncle, how now? Pardon me, gracious Lord, uh, some sudden qualm hath struck me at the heart and dim mine eyes that I can read no further. Uncle of Winchester, I pray, read on. Item, it is further agreed between them that the duchies of Anjou and Maine shall be released and delivered to the king her father, and she sent over of the king of England's own proper cost and charges without having any dowry. They please us well. Lord Marquis, kneel down. We here create thee the first Duke of Suffolk, and gird thee with the sword. Cousin of York, we here discharge your grace from being regent in the parts of France till term of 18 months be full expired. Thanks, Uncle Winchester, Gloucester, York, Buckingham, Somerset, and Warwick. We thank you all for this great favor done in entertainment to my princely queen. Come. Let us in, and with all speed provide to see her coronation be performed. Brave peers of England, pillars of the state, to you Duke Humphrey must unload his grief, your grief, the common grief of all the land. 
What did my brother Henry spend his youth, his valor, coin, and people in the wars to conquer France, his true inheritance? And did my brother Bedford toil his wits to keep by policy what Henry got? Have you yourselves, Somerset, Buckingham, brave York, and victorious Warwick received deep scars in France and Normandy? And shall these labors and these honors die? Oh, peers of England, shameful is this league, fatal this marriage, cancelling your fame, blotting your names from books of memory, undoing all as all had never been. Nephew, what means this passionate discourse, this peroration with such circumstance? For France, tis ours, and we will keep it still. Aye, uncle, we will keep it if we can. But now it is impossible we should. Suffolk, the new-made duke that rules the roost, hath given the duchy of Anjou and Maine under the poor King Rainier, whose large style agrees not with the leanness of his purse. Anjou and Maine? Myself did win them both. Those provinces, these arms of mine, did conquer, and are the cities that I got with wounds delivered up again with peaceful words? Mordieu! For Suffolk's duke, may he be suffocate that dims the honor of this warlike isle. France should have torn and rent my very heart before I would have yielded to this league. She should have stayed in France and starved in France before... My lord of Gloucester, now you grow too hot. It was the pleasure of my lord the king. My lord of Winchester, I know your mind. "'Tis not my speeches that you do mislike, but tis my presence that doth trouble you. Rancor will out. Proud prelate, in thy face I see thy fury. If I longer stay, we shall begin our ancient bickerings. I... Lordings, farewell. And say when I am gone, I prophesied France will be lost ere long. So... There goes our protector in a rage. Tis known to you he is mine enemy, nay more an enemy unto you all, and no great friend I fear me to the king. Consider, lords, he is the next of blood, and heir apparent to the English crown. Look to it, lords, let not his smoothing words bewitch your hearts, be wise and circumspect. What, though the common people favor him, calling him Humphrey, the good duke of Gloucester, I... I fear me, lords, for all this flattering gloss, he will be found a dangerous protector. Why should he, then, protect our sovereign, he being of age to govern of himself? Cousin of Somerset, join you with me, and all together, with the Duke of Suffolk. We'll quickly hoist Duke Humphrey from his seat. This weighty business will not brook delay. I'll to the Duke of Suffolk presently. Cousin of Buckingham, though Humphrey's pride and greatness of his place be grief to us, Yet let us watch the haughty cardinal. His insolence is more intolerable than all the princes in the land besides. If Gloucester be displaced, he'll be protector. Or thou or I, Somerset, will be protector, despite Duke Humphrey or the cardinal. Pride went before. Ambition follows him. While these do labor for their own preferment, behooves it us to labor for the realm. I never saw but Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, did bear him like a noble gentleman. Oft have I seen the haughty cardinal, more like a soldier than a man of the church, swear like a ruffian and demean himself. My uncle York, thy acts in the heart of France, when thou wert regent for our sovereign, have made thee feared and honored of the people. Join we together for the public good in what we can to bridle and suppress the pride of Suffolk and the cardinal, with Somerset's and Buckingham's ambition." And, as we may, cherish Duke Humphrey's deeds while they do tend the profit of the land. <laughs> so York must sit and fret and bite his tongue while his own lands are bargained for and sold. Andrew and Maine both given unto the French. Cold news for me, for I had hope of France, even as I have of fertile England's soil. A day will come when York shall claim his own. And therefore I will take good Warwick's part, and make a show of love to proud Duke Humphrey. And when I spy advantage, claim the crown, for that's the golden mark I seek to hit. Then York be still a while till time do serve. 
till Henry, surfeiting in joys of love with his new bride and England's dear-bought queen, and Humphrey with the peers be fallen at jars, then will I raise aloft the milk-white rose, and in my standard bear the arms of York to grapple with the house of Lancaster, and force perforce I'll make him yield the crown, whose bookish rule hath pulled fair England down. Now that King Henry has reached adulthood and Margaret has been crowned queen, the balance of the court begins to shift. Eleanor, the Duchess of Gloucester, worries that her husband's influence is waning. Why doth the great Duke Humphrey knit his brows as frowning at the favors of the world? Why are thine eyes fixed to the sullen earth, gazing on that which seems to dim thy sight? What seest thou there? King Henry's diadem, enchased with all the honors of the world? If so, gaze on and grovel on thy face until thy head be circled with the same. Put forth thy hand, reach at the glorious gold. What is too short? I'll lengthen it with mine. And having both together heaved it up, we'll both together lift our heads to heaven. Oh, Nell, sweet Nell, if thou dost love thy lord, banish the canker of ambitious thoughts. And may that hour when I imagine ill against my king and nephew, virtuous Henry, be my last breathing in this mortal world. No, my troublous dreams this night doth make me sad. Oh, what dream to my lord? Tell me, and I'll requite it with sweet rehearsal of my morning's dream. Methought this staff, mine office badge in court, was broke in twain. And by whom I have forgot, but as I think, it was by the cardinal. And on the pieces of the broken wand were placed the heads of Somerset and Suffolk. I, this was my dream. What it doth bode, God knows. Tut. This was nothing but an argument that they that break a stick of Gloucester's grove shall lose their head for their presumption. But list to me, my Humphrey, my sweet duke. Methought I sat in seat of majesty, and Henry and Dame Margaret kneeled to me, and on my head did sit the diadem. Nay, Eleanor, then must I chide outright. Art thou not second woman in the realm and the protector's wife, beloved of him? Hast thou not worldly pleasure at command above the reach or compass of thy thought? And wilt thou still be hammering treachery what? to tumble down what, thy husband Lord? and thyself from top of honor to disgrace his feet? No, away from me! Oh, and let so me hear no Eleanor more! Are you for I, telling but her dream? I, uh, Next time I'll keep my dreams unto myself oh, and not be checked. I, no, 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 nay, be not angry. I... Uh, <laughs> I am pleased again. My lord protector... "'Tis his highness' pleasure you do prepare to ride unto St. Albans, "'whereas the king and queen do mean to hawk." "'Oh, I go. "'Come, Nell. Thou wilt ride with us?' "'Yes, my good lord. I'll follow presently.' "'Follow I must. I cannot go before while Gloucester bears this base and humble mind. "'Were I a man, a duke, and next of blood?' I would remove these tedious stumbling blocks and smooth my way upon their headless necks. And being a woman, I will not be slack to play my part in fortune's pageant. Where are you there? Sir John! <gasps> oh, nay, fear not, man. We are alone. Here's none but thee and I. Jesus preserve your royal majesty. <gasps> What sayest thou? Majesty? I am but grace. But by the grace of God and Hume's advice, your grace's title shall be multiplied. What sayest thou, man? Hast thou as yet conferred with Marjorie Jourdain, the cunning witch, with Roger Bolingbroke, the conjurer? And will they undertake to do me good? This they have promised, to show your highness a spirit raised from depth of underground that shall make answer to such questions as by your grace shall be presented him. Here, Hume, take this reward. Make merry man with thy confederates in this weighty cause. Hume must make merry with the Duchess Gold, merry and shall. But how now, Sir John Hume? Seal up your lips and give no words but mum. The business asketh silent secrecy. Yet have I gold flies from another coast, I dare not say, from the rich cardinal and from the great and new-made Duke of Suffolk. They, knowing Dame Elner's aspiring humor, have hired me to undermine the Duchess and buzz these conjurations in her brain. Hume's knavery will be the Duchess's rack, 
and her attainture will be Humphrey's fall. Sort how it will, I shall have gold for all. It has been a few months since the marriage of King Henry and Queen Margaret. Though a friendship grows between the two, Margaret's desire for a more passionate relationship goes unfulfilled. The nobles compete for influence over the young couple, and the people still see Gloucester as the one leading the government. My neighbors, let's stand close. My Lord Protector will come this way by and by, and then we may deliver our supplications in the quill. Marry the Lord Protect him, for he's a good man. Jesus bless him. Here he comes, methinks, and the Queen with him. I'll be the first sure. Come back, fool! This is the Duke of Suffolk, and not my Lord Protector. How now, fellow? Wouldst anything with me? I pray, my Lord, pardon me. I took you for my Lord Protector. To my Lord Protector? Are your supplications to his Lordship? Let me see them. What is thine? Mine is, and please your grace, against John Goodman, my lord cardinal's man, for keeping my house and lands and wife and all from me. Thy wife, too? That's a wrong indeed. Uh, mm. What's yours? What's here? Against the Duke of Suffolk for enclosing the commons of Melford. How now, thou uh, knave? Uh, alas, sir, I am but a poor petitioner of our whole township. Against my employer, Thomas Horner, for saying that the Duke of York was rightful heir to the crown. What says thou? Did the Duke of York say he was rightful heir to the crown? That my employer was? No, forsooth. My employer said that he was and that the king was an usurper. Take this woman in, and send for her employer with a pursivant presently. We'll hear more of your matter before the king. And as for you that love to be protected under the wings of our protector's grace, begin your suits anew and sue to him! Come! Come. Let's, Let's be gone. Let's be gone! My lord of Suffolk, say, is this the guise? Is this the fashions in the court of England? Is this the government of Britain's Isle, and this the royalty of Albion's king? What, shall King Henry be a pupil still under the surly Gloucester's governance? Am I a queen in title and in style, and must be made a subject to a duke? I tell thee, Paul, when in the city tour thou ranst a tilt in honor of my love, and stolst away the ladies' hearts of France, I thought King Henry had resembled thee in courage, courtship, and proportion. But all his mind is bent to holiness. His study is his tilt-yard, and his loves are brazen images of canonized saints. Madam, be patient. As I was cause your highness came to England, so will I in England work your grace's full content. Besides the haughty protector have we Beaufort, the imperious churchman, Somerset, Buckingham, and grumbling York, and not the least of these, but can do more in England than the king. Not all these lords do vex me half so much as that proud dame, the lord protector's wife. She sweeps it through the court with troops of ladies, more like an empress than Duke Humphrey's wife. Strangers in court do take her for the queen. She bears a duke's revenues on her back, and in her heart she scorns our poverty. Madam, myself have limed a bush for her, and placed a choir of such enticing birds that she will light to listen to the lays and never mount to trouble you again. Mm -hmm. So let her rest, and, madam, list to me, mm -hmm. for I am bold to counsel you in this. Although we fancy not the cardinal, yet must we join with him, and with the lords, till we have brought Duke Humphrey in disgrace. As for the Duke of York, this late complaint will make but little for his benefit. So one by one, we'll weed them all at last, and you, yourself, shall steer the happy helm. For my part, noble lords, I care not which, or Somerset or York, all's one to me. If York have ill demeaned himself in France, then let him be denied the regentship. If Somerset be unworthy of the place, let York be regent. I will yield to him. Whether your grace be worthy, yea or no, dispute not that. York is the worthier. Ambitious Warwick, let thy betters speak. The cardinal's not my better in the field. <laughs> All in this presence are thy betters, Warwick. Show some reason, Buckingham, why Somerset should be preferred in this. Because the king, forsooth, will have it so. Madam, 
The king is old enough himself to give his censure. These are no women's matters. If he be old enough, what needs your grace to be protector of his excellence? Madam, I am protector of the realm, and at his pleasure will resign my place. Resign it, then, and leave thine insolence. Since thou wert king, as who is king but thou, the commonwealth hath daily run to rack. Commons hast thou racked? The clergy's bags are lank and lean with thy extortions. Thy sumptuous buildings and thy wife's attire have cost a mass of public treasury. <sighs> thy cruelty and execution upon offenders hath exceeded law, oh. and left thee to the mercy of the law. Thy sale of offices and towns in France, if they were known as a suspect is great, would make thee quickly hop without thy head. Prove this, and I lie open to the law. But God in mercy so deal with my soul as I in duty love my king and country. I... But to the matter that we have in hand. I say, my sovereign, York is meetest man to be your regent in the realm of France. Before we make election, give me leave to show some reason of no little force that York is most unmeet of any man. I'll tell thee, Suffolk, why I am unmeet, because I cannot flatter as thou canst. And yet the worthy <laughs> deeds that York hath done should make him worthy to be honored here. Peace, headstrong Warwick. Image of pride, why should I hold my peace? Because here is a man accused of treason. Please it, your majesty, this woman here hath accused her employer of high treason, and his words were these, that Richard, Duke of York, was rightful heir unto the English crown, and that your majesty was an usurper. Say, man, were these thy words? Uh, and shall please your majesty, I never said nor thought any such matter. God is my witness, I am falsely accused by the villain. By these ten bones, my lords, he did so speak. Base dunghill villain and mechanical, I'll have thy head for this thy traitor's speech. I do beseech your royal majesty, let him have all the rigor of the law. Alas, my lord, hang me if I ever spake the words. Uncle Gloucester, what do you think of this? The law, my lord, is this by case, it rests suspicious, that a day of combat be appointed and there to try each other's right or wrong. And I accept the combat willingly. Alas, my lord, I cannot fight. For God's sake, pity my case. Oh, lord, my heart. <sighs> Sirrah, or you must fight or else be hanged. Away with them to prison, and the day of combat shall be the last of the next month. Give me my fan. What, minion, can you not? No! Oh! <gasps> I cry you mercy, madam. I did mistake. I did not think it had been you. <laughs> did you not, proud Frenchwoman? Could I come near your beauty with my nails, I'd set my Ten Commandments in your face. Sweet aunt, be quiet. Twas against her will. Against her will, good king? Look to it in time. She'll hamper thee and dandle thee like a baby. Though in this place most men folk wear no breeches, she shall not strike Dame Eleanor unrevenged. <laughs> Believe me, my love, thou wert much to blame. I would not for a thousand pounds of gold my noble uncle had been here in place. Uncle Gloucester, what answer makes your grace concerning our regent for the realm of France? My gracious lord, then this is my resolve, for that these words the armorer should speak doth breed suspicion on the part of York. Let Somerset be regent or the French. Then be it so. Duchess of Somerset, we make your grace regent over the French. I humbly thank your royal majesty, and take my leave to post with speed to France. Come, Uncle Gloucester, now let's have our horse, for we will to St. Albans presently. Madam, your hawk, they say, is swift of flight, and we will try how she will fly today. <laughs> Come, my friends, the Duchess, I tell you, expects performance of your promises. Master Hume, we are therefore provided. Mm -hmm. Will her ladyship behold and hear our exorcisms? Aye, what else? Fear you not her courage? Well said, my friends, and welcome all. To this gear, the sooner the better. Madam, sit you and fear not. Whom we raise, we will make fast within a hallowed verge. Orientis princeps Beelzebub, inferni ardentis monarcha et demigorgon, propitanus vos ut appareat et surgat asmath. Asmath, by the eternal God whose name and power thou tremblest at, 
Answer that I shall ask, for till thou speak, thou shalt not pass from hence. Ask what thou wilt, that I had said and done. First of the king, what shall of him become? The duke yet lives that Henry shall depose, but him outlive and die a violent death. Ooh, what fates await the duke of Suffolk? By water shall he die and take his end. What shall befall the Duchess Somerset? Let her shun castles. Have done, for more I hardly can endure. Descend to darkness and the burning lake. Burn! False fiend, avoid! Lay hands upon these traitors and their trash. Oh, ah! What, madam, are you there? The king and commonweal are deeply indebted for this piece of pains. My lord protector will, I doubt it not, see you well guerdoned for these good deserts. Not half so bad as thine to England's king, injurious duke, that threatest wears no cause. True, madam, none at all. What call you this? Away with them, let them be clapped up close. The king is now in progress towards St. Albans. With him... The husband of this lovely lady. Thither goes these news as fast as horse can carry them. A sorry breakfast for my lord protector. Your grace shall give me leave, my lord of York, to be the post in hope of his reward. At your pleasure, my good lady. (laughs) The entrapment of Eleanor's success. York and Buckingham take her into custody. Buckingham heads with the news to St. Albans, where King Henry, Queen Margaret, Suffolk, Gloucester, and Winchester are out hawking. But what a point, my lord, your falcon made! And what a pitch she flew above the rest! Oh, to see how God and all his creatures works! Yea, man and birds are fond of climbing high. <laughs> no marvel, and it like your majesty, my lord protector's hawks do tower so well. They know their keeper loves to be aloft, and bears his thoughts above his falcon's pitch. My lord, tis but a basic noble mind that mounts no higher than a bird can soar. <laughs> I thought as much. He would be above the clouds. Aye, my lord cardinal, how think you by that? Oh, good uncle, hide such malice. With such holiness, can you do it? No malice, sir. No more than well become so good a quarrel and so bad appear. As who, my lord? Why, as you, my lord, and like your lordly lord protectorship. Oh, why, Suffolk, England knows thine insolence. And thy ambition, Gloucester. A pretty peace, good queen. And wet not on these furious peers, for blessed are the peacemakers on earth. Let me be blessed for the peace I make against this proud protector with my sword. Faith, holy uncle, would were come to that. Marry, when thou darest. How now, my lords? Believe me, cousin Gloucester, had not your man put up the fowl so suddenly, we had had more sport. Come with thy two-hand sword. True, uncle! Are you advised? The east side of the grove. I am with you. Why, how now, uncle Gloucester? Talking of hawking, nothing else, my lord. The winds grow high, so do your stomachs, lords. How irksome is this music to my heart. When such strings jar, what hope of harmony? I pray, my lords, let me compound this strife. What tidings with our cousin Buckingham? Such as my heart doth tremble to unfold. The lady Eleanor, the protector's wife, hath practiced dangerously against your state, dealing with witches and with conjurers, raising up wicked spirits from underground, demanding of King Henry's life and death, and other of your highness privy council, as more at large your grace shall understand. Oh, God, what mischiefs work the wicked ones, heaping confusion on their own heads thereby. Gloucester, see here the tincture of thy nest, and look thyself be faultless, thou art best. Madam, for myself, to heaven I do appeal how I have loved my king and commonweal. And for my wife, I know not how it stands. Noble she is, but if she have forgot honor and virtue, and conversed with such as like to pitch defile nobility, I banish her my bed and company, and give her as a prey to law and shame that hath dishonored Gloucester's honest name. Well, for this night, we will repose us here. Tomorrow, toward London, back again, to look into this business thoroughly, and poise the cause in justice equal scales, whose beam stands sure, whose rightful cause prevails. Gloucester's control over English politics is weakening, and other members of the court look to step into the gap. Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York, has begun to collect allies. He is the richest landowner in the country, a descendant of Edward III, and already has multiple male heirs.
Now, my good Lady Warwick, our simple supper ended, give me leave in this close walk to satisfy myself in craving your opinion of my title, which is infallible to England's crown. My lord, I long to hear it out in full. Then thus... Edward III, my lady, had seven sons. Uh-huh. The first, Edward the Black Prince, Prince of Wales. The second, William of Hatfield. And the third, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, next to whom was John, John of, of Gaunt. Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. <laughs> the fifth was Edmund, Edmund Langley. Langley, Duke of York. The sixth was Thomas of Woodstock, Duke of Gloucester. Uh-huh. William of Windsor was the seventh and last. Edward the Black Prince died before his father and left behind him Richard, Richard. his only son, who, mm-hmm. after Edward III's death, reigned as king till Henry Bolingbroke, <laughs> Duke of Lancaster, the eldest son and heir of John of Gaunt, crowned by the name of Henry, Henry IV. IV, seized on the realm, deposed the rightful king, sent his poor queen to France from whence she came, and him to Pomfret, <gasps> where, as we all know, harmless Richard was murdered traitorously. Well, thus got the House of Lancaster the crown. Which now they hold by force and not by right. For Richard, the first son's heir being dead, the issue of the next son should have reigned. But William of Hatfield died without an heir. The third son, Duke of Clarence, from whose line I claim the crown, had issue. Philippa, a daughter, who married Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March. Edmund had issue, Roger, Earl of March. Roger had issue, Edmund, Anne, and Eleanor. This Edmund in the reign of Bolingbroke, as I have read, laid claim unto the crown, but to the rest. His eldest sister Anne, my mother, being heir unto the crown, married Richard, Earl of Cambridge, who was son to Edmund Langley, Edward III's fifth son. By her, I claim the kingdom. She was heir to Roger, Earl of March, who was the son of Edmund Mortimer, who married Uh Philippa, sole daughter unto Lionel, Duke of Clarence. So if the issue of the elder son succeed before the younger, I am king. What plain proceedings is more plain than this? (laughs) Henry doth claim the crown from John of Gaunt, the fourth son. York claims it from the third. Long live our sovereign Richard, England's king. (laughs) We thank you, lady, but I am not your king. Till I be crowned, and that my sword be stained with heart blood of the house of Lancaster. And that's not suddenly to be performed, but with advice and silent secrecy. Do you as I do in these dangerous days. Wink at the Duke of Suffolk's insolence, at Beaufort's pride, at Somerset's ambition, at Buckingham and all the crew of them, till they have snared the shepherd of the flock, that virtuous prince, the good Duke Humphrey. Hmm. Tis that they seek, and they in seeking that shall find their deaths, if York can prophesy. My heart assures me that the Countess Warwick shall one day make the Duke of York a king. And Warwick, this I do assure myself. Richard shall live to make the Countess Warwick the greatest soul in England but the king. (laughs) Before taking any further public action on his claim to the crown, York must avoid suspicion of guilt after his armorer, Horner, has been accused of treason by the apprentice Penny. King Henry summons his court to watch their trial by combat and pass judgment on Eleanor, the Duchess of Gloucester. Stand forth, Dame Eleanor Cobham, Gloucester's wife. Receive the sentence of the law for sins such as by God's book are adjudged to death. You, madam, for you are more nobly born, despoiled of your honor and your life, shall, after three days open penance done, live in your country, here in banishment, with Sir John Stanley in the Isle of Man. Welcome is banishment. Welcome were my death. Eleanor, the law thou seest hath judged thee. I cannot justify whom the law condemns. Mine eyes are full of tears. My heart of grief. I beseech your majesty, give me leave to go. Stay, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, ere thou go. Give up thy staff. Henry will to himself protector be. And God shall be my hope, my stay, my guide, and lantern to my feet. I see no reason why a king of years should need to be protected like a child. God and King Henry govern England's helm. Give up your staff, sir, and the king his realm. My staff. Here, noble Henry, is my staff. As willingly do I the same resign as ere thy father Henry made it mine. And even as willingly at thy feet I leave it as others would ambitiously receive it. Farewell, good king. When I am dead and gone, 
May honorable peace attend thy throne. This staff of honor wrought, there let it stand, where it best fits to be, in Henry's hand. Lords, let him go. Please it, your majesty. This is the day appointed for the combat, and readier the appellant and defendant. Uh, in God's name, see the lists and all things fit. Here, let them end it, and God defend the right. I never saw a person worse bestead or more afraid to fight than is the appellant, the servant of this armor, <laughs> my lords. <laughs> Here, 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 neighbor, neighbor Horner, I drink to you in a cup of sack. Cup of sack! sack. Woo! Woo! And fair not, neighbor, you shall do well. <laughs> and here's a pot of good double beer, neighbor. <laughs> drink, drink, and fear not. Let it come, in faith, and I'll pledge you all and a fig for a penny. <laughs> Here, Penny, I drink to thee, and be not afraid! Ah, be merry, Penny, and fear not thy employer. Fight for credit of the prentices! The prentices! Ah! I thank you all. Drink and pray for me, I pray you, for I think I have taken my last draft in this world. Here, Robin. Yeah? And if I die, I give thee my apron. Oh. And will... Thou shalt have my hammer. Oh, Lord, bless me. I pray, God, for I am never able to deal with my employer. Come, leave your drinking and fall to blows. Sirah, what's thy name? Penny, forsooth. Penny. What more? Thump. Thump. Then see thou thump thy employer well. Neighbors! <laughs> I am come hither, as it were, upon Thump's instigation to prove her a knave and myself an honest man. Oh! And, oh! And, oh! and touching the Duke of York, I will take my death. I never meant him any ill, nor the king, uh, nor the queen. And therefore, Penny, have at thee with a downright blow. Oh! Oh! I confess, I confess treason. No! Take away his weapon. Missus, thank God and the good wine in thy employer's way. Oh God, have I overcome my enemies in this presence? Oh, Penny, thou hast prevailed in right. Go, take hence that traitor from our sight, for by his death we do perceive his guilt. And God in justice hath revealed to us the truth and innocence of this poor woman, which he had thought to have murdered wrongfully. Come, Sirrah, follow us for thy reward. <laughs> King Henry has dissolved Gloucester's position as Lord Protector. His wife Eleanor and her associates have been found guilty of treason. Eleanor's life is spared but she is sentenced to a public penance and must walk barefoot about the streets of London. Ten is the hour that was appointed me to watch the coming of my punished duchess. Sweet Nell, ill can thy noble mind have brooked the abject people gazing on thy face with envious looks laughing at thy shame, that erst did follow thy proud chariot wheels when thou didst ride in triumph through the streets. Oh, but soft, I think she comes. And I'll prepare my tear-stained eyes to see her miseries. Come you, my lord, to see my open shame? Now thou dost penance too. Look how they gaze. See how the giddy multitude do point and nod their heads and throw their eyes on thee. Oh, Gloucester, hide thee from their hateful looks. Be patient, gentle Nell. Forget this grief. Oh, Gloucester, teach me to forget myself. For whilst I think I am thy married wife, and thou a prince, protector of this land, methinks I should not thus be led along, mailed up in shame, with papers on my back. The ruthless flint doth cut my tender feet, and when I start, the envious people laugh, and bid me be advised how I tread. Oh, Humphrey, can I bear this shameful yoke? Sometimes I'll say, I am Duke Humphrey's wife, and he a prince and ruler of the land. 
Yet so he ruled, and such a prince he was, as he stood by whilst I, his forlorn duchess, was made a wonder and a pointing stock to every idle rascal follower. But be thou mild, and blush not at my shame, nor stir at nothing till the axe of death hang over thee, as sure it shortly will. For Suffolk, he that can do all in all, with her that hateth thee and hates us all, and York and impious Beaufort, that false priest, have all limed bushes to betray thy wings. Ah, oh, Nell, forbear. Thou aimest all awry. I must offend before I be attainted. And had I twenty times so many foes, and each of them had twenty times their power, all these could not procure me any scathe so long as I am loyal, true, and crimeless. I summon your grace to his majesty's parliament, being held at Barry, the first of this next month. And my consent ne'er asked herein before? This is close dealing. Well, I will be there. My Nell. I take my leave. And, Sir John Stanley, let not her penance exceed the King's commission. And it please your grace, I am appointed now to take her with me to the Isle of Man. Entreat her not the worse, and that I pray you use her well. The world may laugh again, and I may live to do you kindness, if you do it her. And so, Sir John, farewell. What, gone, my lord, and bid me not farewell? With this my tears, I cannot stay to speak. Art thou gone too? All comfort go with thee, for none abides with me. My joy is death. Death at whose name I oft have been afeard because I wished this world's eternity Stanley, I prithee go and take me hence. Madam, your penance done, throw off this sheet, and go we to attire you for our journey. My shame will not be shifted with my sheet. No, it will hang upon my richest robes and show itself. Attire me how I can. Go, lead the way. I long to see my prison. You've been listening to Shakespeare's History, Season 2, The Queen's Storm, presented by Brave Spirits Theatre, directed by Charlene V. Smith. This recording is produced and edited by Patrick Flynn.